Do you enjoy creepy horror stories? Be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. In the Library by Ron Ripley Roland White stifled a yawn and glanced at his student worker. Chandra was half asleep, slumped in the chair at the desk. Roland looked to his computer and saw the time had advanced, precisely one minute to 11.33 p.m. Chandra? Roland said after a moment. She straightened up and turned in the seat to face him. Go on home, he said. Are you sure? she asked. Roland grinned. We haven't had a student in here since 10. I think it's safe to assume that there's not going to be a mad rush for the library in the next 12 minutes before I lock the front doors. She smiled, got out of the chair, and stretched. Yeah, I don't think so. Do you think there'll be classes tomorrow? How much snow is out there? He asked in reply. Chandra wandered out in front of the circulation desk and stopped, her eyes widening. Holy moly, Roland, she said. There's got to be at least eight inches out there right now. What? He shook his head in disbelief. Standing up, he walked to stand beside the small young woman and felt his shoulders slump. Damn! Don't you live far from here? She asked. Yeah, he muttered. In Concord. Damn, I'm not going to be able to drive in this stuff. She looked at him, concerned. Where are you going to stay? Here, he answered. In Geisel Library? Chandra's voice was filled with surprise. Won't the brothers mind? I don't think anyone is going to mind, Roland answered. Because I don't think any of St. Anselm's college staff's going to come around at two or three in the morning to make sure I'm not sleeping in the break room. And will you be? She asked, grinning. I will not, Roland said straightening up with false pride. I shall be sleeping upstairs in the teacher's private study area. Chandra laughed, a rich, beautiful sound that rang out through the empty building. As long as you're okay, she said, reaching out and resting her hand on his arm for a moment. She drew it back quickly, brushed a stray lock of hair behind her ear, and smiled at him. Just be safe. I will, he said. I promise. Chandra nodded. Together they returned to the circulation desk, and she gathered up her belongings in silence. Within a minute she was packed and ready to go, winding a scarf around the lower half of her face. Have a good night, she said cheerfully, and left the library. You too, he called after her. And when she had exited the building, he dug the key to the doors out from the drawer. He tapped the ring of keys against his hand, pausing only to select the proper one when he reached the double doors. Roland locked them, double-checked that they were secure, and then went about the long and familiar process of shutting the building down. He worked his way from the lower level where the periodicals, DVDs, and Blu-rays were kept to the reading room and the first-floor general collection. He paused at the circulation desk to gather up his belongings and carry them with him up the stairs to the second floor. He opened the Craig room, the teacher's private study area, and smiled at the light that shone in through the tall, arched window. The illumination was provided by the lamps that lit up St. Anselm's Chapel, across from the library, and the light revealed the beauty of the furniture and books. A pair of glass doors set between magnificent wire-fronted and locked bookshelves led to a conference room and the archivist's office. Roland stood still for several minutes, soaking in the beauty of the place and enjoying the smell of wood polish and old books. Finally, he set his belongings down in the center of the room and sat down on one of the chairs. He untied his shoes, set them off to one side, and loosened his belt and undid the top button of his pants. From the chairs, Roland removed the cushions, laying them out on the floor. They wouldn't be the most comfortable pillows he had used, but he had fared worse in his teen years. Yawning, he laid down and stretched out. The room was warm and pleasant. 
the sight of the snow falling beyond the arched window, beautiful and peaceful to observe. Roland pulled his coat over him, turned over onto his right side, and closed his eyes. He listened to the sound of the heating system, the steady thrum of equipment pushing hot air through the massive 300,000-volume library. Roland smiled, pulled the coat tighter around him, and waited for sleep to come. At some point, he drifted off, and at 3.33 a.m., he was awakened by a knocking. His eyes snapped open, and it took him a moment to remember he wasn't home in his studio apartment. I'm in the library, he thought. What woke me up? Something knocked on the wall. He sat up. That's what woke me up. Roland tilted his head to one side, listening. For a third time, the knocking came. It originated to his right, where on the opposite side, the general circulation stacks continued from the D's to the K's. Someone else was in the library. Frowning, Roland shook his head, let his coat fall to the floor, and put his shoes back on. Leaving his belongings in the room, he exited it, padding through the semi-darkness to the stacks. When he reached them, he flipped on the lights, fully expecting a shocked voice to cry out. But nothing happened. He walked quickly down the long length of the aisle that ran along the stacks, and he was surprised that there wasn't a sign of anyone else. Standing at the far end, he scratched his head. Did I hear someone? Or was it just some piping knocking? Roland knew that no one had gotten past him and he didn't recall anyone sneaking into the library before Chandra left. He scratched the back of his head and called out, Hello? No one answered him. Hey, Roland continued into the silence. I'm stuck here too. Listen, I don't care if you're in here. At least not tonight, okay? The snow's terrible. He waited, listening for a response. When nothing was forthcoming, he shrugged. Got to be the pipes or something, he thought. He walked back to the switches, turned the lights off, and returned to the Craig room. As the door closed, he hesitated. Once it clicked shut, he double-checked the lock, nodded, and went back to his makeshift bed. He sat down on the floor, took his shoes off, and waited. He started counting. When he reached 100, he sighed. I need sleep, he thought. Must be overtired. Roland laid down, pulled his coat over him again, and closed his eyes. But he was unable to sleep. He found himself listening, waiting to see if the knocking would occur again. It did not. For half an hour, he regularly checked his phone. At a little past four, he put it down. The doorknob rattled. Roland sat up instantly, his heart thundering in his chest. In the dull light of the room, he saw the brass knob turn left, then right, and then back again. He opened his mouth to call out to whoever it was, but then he changed his mind. Bull, Roland thought, fear transforming into anger. I'll catch them red-handed. He stood up silently and crept forward in his stockinged feet. The doorknob continued to move and rattle, the brass turning farther each time, as if the person on the opposite side wanted to break the lock. Roland stopped in front of the door, his heart racing and his blood thumping loudly in his ears. Taking a deep breath, he reached out and grabbed hold of the doorknob. With a gasp, he jerked his hand back. The doorknob was cold, painfully so, as if he had thrust his hand into a bucket of ice water. The door squealed in its framework as something pushed against it. Clutching his injured hand, Roland stumbled back, horrified at the way the door seemed to bow inward. Within a split second, the door was normal again, as if it had been nothing more than a sleep-deprived hallucination. Roland looked down at his hand, his palm and fingers red and pulsing. I'll call security, he thought shakily, hurrying back to his belongings. I don't care if they kick me out. This is absurd. He picked up his cell phone and keyed it on. 
Nothing happened. He tried again with the same result. How? He shook his head. The damned thing was almost fully charged. Whatever, Roland thought. I'll go into the conference room. He dropped his phone to his bag, turned to go into the conference room, and he came to a sharp stop. Someone was in the other room, peering through the glass at him. Roland stared at the stranger, a teenage girl, no older than 18 or 19. Her clothing was outdated, perhaps by as much as 30 or 40 years. The girl's dark hair hung in a pair of braids down the front of her shirt, and her thin face bore a grim expression. He opened his mouth to speak, and the girl vanished. Roland blinked several times before he hurried forward and pushed the conference room door open. Cold air washed over him and set his teeth to chattering. He turned on the light, which flickered once before going out. Roland licked his lips, then stepped over to the phone. He lifted the handset to his ear and heard nothing. The phone was dead. No, he thought. The lamps lining the campus were still lit, which meant there was still power. The phone should still be up, Roland thought dully. There shouldn't be anything wrong with them. He rubbed the back of his neck nervously and wandered back to the Craig room. Stepping over to the window, he looked down at the snow-covered street and realized there was nowhere for him to go. At least not off campus he thought. I could go to one of the dorms, get the hell out of here for the last couple of hours. Hell, they might even have the dining hall open in a little bit. I could stay there. With a plan in mind, Roland relaxed and nodded to himself. Yeah, he thought. I'll go to the dining hall. I can get there by walking, and the snow shouldn't be that bad. Quickly, Roland fixed his pants and belt put his shoes back on and got his belongings together. He set the cushions back on their chairs, put on his coat, and walked to the door. It wouldn't open. He tried turning it hard to the left, then hard to the right. Neither worked. Roland swallowed dryly, turning away from the door and went into the conference room. From there, he traveled down the small hallway to the archivist's office, hesitated, then tried the heavy glass doors that led back to the stacks. The door wouldn't open. He struggled with it, fighting a rising sense of panic. Breathing heavily, he put his shoulder against the door, trying to pop it open. Nothing worked. Panting, Roland stepped back and shouted in surprise. The girl was on the other side of the door, and he could see through her. Her uninterested expression was unsettling as was the fact that if she were to smile, she might be beautiful. But there was a coldness in her eyes, a lack of emotion that Roland hated and feared. What are you? He whispered. Dead, she answered, and vanished. Roland stood still, horrified. He tried the door again, but it remained locked to him. Turning to the archivist's office, Roland tried to get in, but that too was locked. With his shoulders slumped, Roland returned to the Craig room and tried that door again. He screamed and snapped his hand back. It was too cold. Shaking with fear, Roland walked to one of the chairs and sat down slowly in it. The doorknob rattled, and Roland whimpered, hating himself for it. Back and forth it turned until finally the doorknob snapped and fell to the floor. The door didn't open, but the young woman appeared in the room, staring at him. Go away, Roland whispered. Help me, she whispered. Paradise lost. Without another word, she turned and walked into a bookcase. Roland sat in the chair, stunned. He stared at the bookcase she had passed through, then stood up and approached it cautiously. Dozens of books lined the shelves, most of the volumes bound in leather. Roland leaned forward and read some of the titles. He made it through the top shelf, then the next, and at the end of the third, 
he found a battered, leather-bound copy of Dante's Paradise Lost. Roland reached out, took hold of the book, and tried to take it off the shelf. Instead of the volume coming free, it tilted toward him, and a loud click filled the still air. The bookcase swung out into the room several inches, and a long, low hiss filled the air. With his throat closing spasmodically, Roland grabbed the edge of the bookcase and pulled it farther into the room. Cool air eased out of the narrow stairwell, revealed and illuminated by the light from the arched window. Roland leaned in and looked down the tight stairs, noticing with some displeasure how the stairwell turned sharply to the right. It's going to be dark, he thought. I know it is. I'm not afraid of the dark, Roland thought, straightening up. Not at all. He glanced back at his belongings for a moment, then decided against carrying them. In the semi-darkness of the stairwell, Roland took a deep breath to calm himself. His hand found the slim wrought iron railing set into the brickwork of the wall, and he gripped it tightly. Okay, he thought, taking a deep breath. Okay, here I go. He stepped down onto the thin wooden stairs. It creaked but bore his weight, and a flood of relief washed over him. Thank you, he thought, shaking. His next step was a little more confident, as was the third. By the time he reached the first landing and prepared to enter the darkness, most of his fear and concern were gone. He didn't rush down the stairs, but he didn't linger over each either. Turning the corner of the landing, Roland left the last vestiges of light and safety behind him. He moved at a slower, more cautious pace. He also tried to keep track of the number of steps he took, but lost count early on. For ten minutes, he descended the stairs and was confident he was no longer in the library when he stepped down onto a hard surface almost stumbling as his foot sought and did not find another step. He caught himself from falling and came to a stop. I must be under where the original library was, Roland thought. He reached his hands out to either side, and the left hand felt a cold stone wall. Roland adjusted his position so he was facing it and carefully ran his hands along the surface. Several minutes later, Roland was rewarded with what felt like an old light switch beneath his fingers. It was a push-button control, the lower button clacking loudly as he pressed it. Light burst into the room and Roland was forced to cover his eyes until they became accustomed. He lowered his hand and examined the small room. Old red bricks with crumbling mortar formed the walls, and the low ceiling was made from wide boards. A single light with a bright clear bulb hung from a porcelain socket. The wiring was ancient, wrapped in braided frayed cloth that was tacked to the ceiling and run through eyelets set in the mortar until it reached the switch. As he turned around in the small confined space, Roland stopped, surprised. A narrow wooden door, bound with iron, ran from floor to ceiling and was set in the wall. The door was open a fraction of an inch, and Roland felt a chill as he looked at it. From the room came the young woman's voice. Please, she begged, help me. Fear gripped Roland's stomach, squeezed and demanded he flee back up the stairs. He stood there, clenching his hands into fists, fighting back his desire to run, and finally mastering himself. Taking a deep, shuddering breath, Roland stepped forward and cautiously edged the door open farther. Oh, no, he whispered, shocked and disturbed by what he saw. A skeleton was on the floor of a circular room no larger than a broom closet. Pigtails hung from the skull's head. And while the clothes were rotten, there was still enough left for Roland to identify them. He was looking at the remains of the ghost. What happened? Roland asked softly. I don't remember, 
the girl replied from behind him, causing him to shiver with fear. But it was here, down here, that I died. I know that. I remember that. You remember dying? Roland asked. Yes, she said. What's your name? He asked her. Jody, she replied. I'm Roland, he said. That's a good name, she said, sounding shy. A strong name. I like it. For some reason, Roland felt himself blushing. Will you help me, Roland? She asked. Um, sure, he said. Do you need me to get someone? You know, to move your bones? Yes, she said excitedly. Oh, yes. I can do that, Roland said, straightening up proudly. Oh, please, Jody sobbed. That would be wonderful. Okay, Roland said. I mean, yes, I'll do that. He turned to leave, but Jody spoke again. Roland, she said hesitantly. Yeah? He turned back to look at the body on the floor of the small prison. I don't know if she's still alive, Jody began. But my mother, she gave me a crucifix. It's beautiful. It even has my name inscribed on the back. If I tell you my address, do you think you could give it to her? Of course, Roland said, nodding. I can do that for you. Where is it? You might be upset, Jody said her voice hardly more than a whisper. It's, well, it's still around my neck. You don't have to if it's too much. I understand. The sadness in her tone told him that she did understand. That understanding made his decision for him. I can do that for you, Roland said. I don't want to hurt your bones, though. You know? She laughed, a beautiful, sweet sound that seemed out of place in the odd little room. I do indeed know, Jody laughed. You won't hurt me, Roland. Not even my feelings. Okay, Roland said. I believe you. He stepped into the small room, crouched down and shifted to one side, trying to let as much light shine into the room as possible. Roland rocked back on his heels, looking at the skeleton's posture, trying to see where the crucifix was. He caught sight of it a moment later. Smiling, he reached out with both hands, and for several minutes, he fumbled with the clasp. Finally, he was able to remove it. It's beautiful, Roland said, holding it up. It is, she whispered. Too beautiful to be hidden away like this. Would you do me another favor, Roland? Sure, he said, grinning. Would you lay it out on the floor here for a minute? I want to watch it shine and glow, she whispered. He nodded, crouched down, and spread the chain and crucifix out on the floor from the doorway to the prison. So pretty, she whispered, and then an unseen force barreled into Roland, sending him stumbling back into the small room. His feet became tangled with the skeleton, and he smashed his face against the wall hard enough to cause stars to explode in its vision. He twisted around to ask her what was going on, and the door slammed shut. Roland heard it lock shut, and he screamed in fear. He did so until his throat threatened to break, and as soon as he stopped, Jody spoke. There was no hint of kindness in her voice, no gentleness. 
I've been waiting an awfully long time, she said. Roland bit his lip and kept himself silent. It's been decades since I saw anyone, she whispered. Decades since anyone could see me. Do you understand that? He didn't respond. There was humor in her voice when she spoke again. You don't, but that's all right. You're here now, Roland, and here's where you'll remain. The final statement caused him to sit upright, horrified at the smug tone in her voice. No, he said, his voice rising slightly. No, you can't. I can she said tightly, and what's more, I want to. What are you going to gain by doing this? Roland asked shrilly. Pleasure, Jody replied promptly. I'm going to sit in the darkness, and I am going to listen to you go mad. I'm going to listen to you as you struggle to stay alive and stay sane. I'll watch as you eat whatever you can catch to fend off starvation. Her voice became throatier with satisfaction as she said, But it won't be enough. Roland's head pounded as he tried to process what the ghost was saying, tried to understand what was happening. I thought you wanted my help, he whispered. I do, she said with mocking sincerity. And you're giving it to me. Do you have any idea how much I will enjoy this? Roland's stomach growled and the dead woman laughed. Oh, what a pleasant sound, she murmured. You're hungry already. No, he said, shaking his head. No, I'm not. I'm not. But you are, Jody whispered. And are you thirsty, too? Roland was. He swallowed dryly tried to generate some spit in his mouth and found he couldn't. He was too frightened. His stomach growled again. I chewed on my shoes, Jody said, her voice suddenly close to his ear. They were leather, but they were too tough. My teeth, they were loose from the starvation. The leather pulled them out. Roland sank to the floor and curled up into a fetal position. Beneath him, the scattered bones were cold and uncomfortable. He didn't move. Instead, he tucked his head down and jammed his thumb into his mouth, sucking on it vigorously, as he had when he was a toddler. When I was thirsty, she whispered, I tore open my arm and drank my own blood. It was thick, you know. Dehydration and starvation? There was little for me to slake my thirst. My blood was not what I needed. Roland squeezed his eyes shut, shuddering against the bones. I needed water, but there was none, Jody continued. I needed to eat, and so I did. I found shards of brick and stone. I gouged and tore at my leg, carved out pieces small enough to swallow whole. But as I ate, I bled, and as I bled, I died, died with a mouthful of my own leg. Stop, Roland whimpered around his thumb. A mouthful, she repeated, her voice heavy with glee. I cannot describe the taste to you, Roland, the way the meat felt on my tongue, the salt and the fat, thick and maddening. Please, he moaned, pressing his forehead against the cold floor. Please, please just stop. Can you imagine it, Roland? Jody asked as he shivered on the floor. Can you? 
please, he begged. Well, Jody said, and he felt a cold hand on his shoulder. You'll know soon enough, won't you? The grumbling of Roland's stomach filled the silence that followed. Are you looking for more creepy horror stories? Click the link in the description or search Scare Street on Audible for a list of all our bone-chilling titles. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more spooky videos from Scare Street. See you in the shadows.